Welcome to the third video in the series looking at academic integrity and in this particular video we're focusing on referencing in accordance with the Australian Guide to Legal Citation, also abbreviated to AGLC. Now we know that to avoid plagiarism we must acknowledge the source and we must do that each time that we use someone else's work or ideas. However, simply just writing the name of the source in a footnote is not sufficient. You have to provide sufficient information so that the reader can actually locate the original source and find that work or idea themselves. Now, each discipline uses a referencing guide to ensure that sufficient information is provided to the reader. And you will, of course, if you're in a double degree, need to comply with the relevant referencing guide for your discipline. But when you're completing work in, in the course of your law studies, you need to make sure that you are complying with the Australian Guide to Legal Citation. Note that the AGLC adopts the referencing conventions that you will see in legal practice. So for example, if you were to prepare an outline of argument, now that's a document that's handed in in advance of a hearing, it's handed in to the judge and your opponent to indicate what your key arguments will be and upon what sources you will rely during the course of your oral submissions. If you were to prepare that document, you would need to reference the sources so that the judge and your opponent can actually go and locate those sources and see what their thoughts are about what you say the law is and how it applies. Now, in law, for example, we always cite the parties' names in italics, so that's the parties' names and the V in italics. And when we're talking about legislation, we always place the X title and the year in italics. The AGLC therefore introduces you to these referencing conventions that you will encounter in legal practice. So it's great practice now for your future career as a lawyer. Now the AGLC is large and it looks really overwhelming, I totally get that. But there are two things to note here. The first is that generally it's full of lots of examples and there's therefore not as much reading of rules as you think. And the examples can often be even more helpful than the explanation of the rule itself. So make sure that you review the examples carefully when you are trying to work out what's required. Second, remember that the more you use the AGLC and the more familiar you become with it, the more instinctive those basic rules become to you. While you might need to spend a lot of time checking your referencing in your first term, by the time you get to second year, it's unlikely that you will need to look up how to cite a case or another basic rule like how to cite a direct quote. So remember that while it's a big learning curve at the moment, it will become easier later on. So each time that you write an assignment, make sure that you brush up on the AGLC before you start and make sure that you constantly refer to it as you're completing your referencing in that assignment. Note that also there are some quick guides to the AGLC on Moodle. They're all set out differently, so have a look at them and work out which one suits you, you know, which one you find the easiest to navigate. So let's have a look at the basic rules now. The first thing that we're going to look at is primary sources of law, which are, of course, legislation and cases, and we'll deal with legislation first. Now, you'll remember that the synonyms for legislation are statutes or acts of parliament, and often acts of parliament are shortened right down to the word acts. Now, as you can see on the slide there, there's some examples of the AGLC requirements. So the Acts Interpretation Act 1901, which is a, a piece of federal legislation, you'll see that the title and the year are all italicized. It's also important to provide the reader with the jurisdiction information so that they know whether to go and locate that source from Queensland or from New South Wales or the Commonwealth, etc. And the way that we do that is that we abbreviate the jurisdiction in round brackets. So if the Act has been passed by the Federal Parliament, we would place a capital C and then lowercase t and h in round brackets, and that indicates to the reader that it is a Commonwealth piece of legislation. If the legislation is passed by a state or territory parliament, we need to abbreviate it according to the list on the slide that you can see there. So for example, Queensland is a capital Q and then a lowercase l and d, and New South Wales is all capitals NSW. 
Now in most cases you will also need to provide the reader with information about the, re the actual section itself. In other words, you need to tell the reader exactly where within that very long piece of legislation they can actually locate the relevant law. So let's say that you want to refer to section 14 of the Queensland version of the Acts Interpretation Act 1956. You can see on the slide there that we use a lowercase s which represents section and then a space and then the section number that you want to refer to. And note that that follows the Act title, year and jurisdiction. Now there's a slight variation when it comes to citing bills. So bills of course haven't been passed by Parliament yet, they are proposed legislative changes but they've not yet gone through the necessary legislative process to become an Act. When we cite bills we follow the same format above in terms of writing the title and the year and providing the jurisdiction, the abbreviated jurisdiction in brackets, but we don't italicize the title or the year. So when it's a bill, note that it's got the word bill there rather than act and also it's not italicized and that's the main difference between an act and a bill. Now the AGLC has further referencing rules for citing an explanatory memorandum, for regulations and rules and other legislative materials. So make sure you thoroughly read that section in the AGLC. Moving on to cases, they're quite complicated in terms of how they are cited. The first thing to note is that cases are usually cited by reference to the parties' names, so the parties involved in the dispute. Now you can generally locate a case on databases like Westlaw and Lexis Advance by just using the parties' names, but we still need to provide the citation information so that there are other means of locating the cases where they can't be located just by name alone. Note that when we're discussing cases, the V that you see, so look at the first case there, Commercial Bank of Australia, and then it's got a V and then Armadio. The V is pronounced as AND in civil cases. So we would say Commercial Bank of Australia AND Armadio. In criminal matters, the V is pronounced as AGAINST. The R is pronounced CROWN. So that actually is said as CROWN AGAINST Phillips. Now as you can see it doesn't matter whether it's a criminal matter, Crown against Phillips, or whether it's a civil matter, Commercial Bank of Australia and Armadio, the way that they are written appears the same in that all the parties names are italicized and so is the V, the V is also italicized. You then need to provide the year of the case in brackets and you'll see that some cases have round brackets and some cases have square brackets. So how do you know whether to use round brackets or square brackets? Well, round brackets means that the reports are organised by volume number rather than year. So if you looked at the law reports on a shelf, they would be numerically ordered by reference to their volume number. And some volumes span more than one year and there may be several volumes in one year. In contrast, where the law reports are organised by year, you need to use square brackets. Unreported decisions, now these are judgments that have not been reported in a law report series by a publisher. These always have square brackets. In the age of the internet, we can still access unreported court judgments from the superior courts that have not been published by a publisher, and we locate them through the relevant court websites. More on citing unreported decisions shortly. Let's still carry on with how we cite cases generally. So we've got the parties' names in italics and the V in italics. The year is not italicized and it's placed into either square or round brackets depending on how the law report series are organized or if it's an unreported decision it's always square. The next thing to do is provide the volume number if there is one. So you can see there in Commercial Bank of Australia and Armadio the volume number is 151. It appears immediately after the year in brackets and before the abbreviated law report series. 
Following the volume number, we then move on to the law report series, which is abbreviated. You can see there CLR, which stands for Commonwealth Law Reports. Now note that appellate decisions are often reported in a range of law reports. That means that you have a choice to make as to which to cite. Generally, and the AGLC says this at page 51, generally we should select the authorised law reports. So when researching, locate the authorised law report on the relevant database in preference to any other law report series. Now page 51 of the AGLC lists the authorised law reports that are most commonly cited. Now you may ask, how do I know what the abbreviation stands for when I'm reading about a case in a textbook or a journal article? Well, that abbreviation, you can decode that by using an abbreviations guide. And I'm going to provide a link to a comprehensive abbreviations guide on Moodle. So you just take the first letter of that abbreviation, which in the first example would be C. You then look it up and see what it stands for, and then you can work out how to locate that particular law report series on the relevant databases. Now after the law report abbreviation comes the page number that the that particular case starts at within the law report series. So here going back to Commercial Bank of Australia and Armadio, you'll see that the page number is 447. So that's where that judgment begins. Now you can see on, on the second example of Crown against Phillips, that this is a 2018 decision. It's volume one. The law report abbreviation is QDR. That stands for Queensland Reports. And that judgment starts at page 199. Now this all seems really quite tricky and it's natural to want to avoid having to comply with this, but it's really important that you conform to the citation of cases in this manner, because otherwise your opponent, the judge, and other people relying on your work, such as your supervisor, might not be able to locate the source, because we've all eventually got used to doing it, and now we look at this information and we can easily decode it and know where we need to go for that information. So just remember that it takes time, it takes practice, but you will eventually get to the position where you can naturally write that information and also naturally interpret it. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we have unreported decisions. What this means is that a publishing house has not reported the decision in a law report series. But that doesn't mean that the source is unhelpful or that it's of little value. You can still refer to the law in such decisions and the law in those cases is just as authoritative as a reported decision. It's just that for whatever reason, the relevant publishing houses have not published that case in a law report series. Now, where you want to cite a case that has not been reported, you'll need to use the medium neutral citation, which is the citation the court prescribes for the judgment when it's released. Now, you can see on the slide there that Crown against Hanley is an example. As usual, the party's names and the V are placed into italics and the year is placed into square brackets. And we always use square brackets because it's unreported. QCA is the medium neutral citation for the Queensland Court of Appeal. And 276 is the identifier for the case. Now again, if you don't know what QCA stands for, you can go to an abbreviations list but note that it will tell you which court it comes from, so then you know that you have to go and locate that material on the relevant court website. Now, where, where a decision has been reported, you must always use a reported version in preference to an unreported decision. Um, we only use unreported decisions where we cannot find a reported version at all, but we still need to refer to the case. Now, where you're talking about a case, let's say in an assignment, and you're explaining the law. If you're talking about a certain aspect of the case, then you need the pinpoint reference that is directly relevant to that aspect. In such cases, provide a page number wherever possible. So you can see towards the bottom of the slide there, the way that we indicate the page reference, the pinpoint page reference to the reader, is to place a comma after the full citation of the case and then the page number. So in relation to Commercial Bank of Australia and Armadio, 
you can see the full citation, then a comma, and then 460. That tells the reader that the relevant page within that judgment is 460. If no page number is available, judgments generally have paragraph numbers. So you can use those instead. And you'll often find that unreported decisions don't have page numbers, they only have paragraph numbers. So paragraph numbers are indicated to the reader by placing the paragraph number within square brackets. And you can see that there in relation to Crown against Hanley. So you've got the full citation as before. No comma this time though, just the square brackets with 10 inside, which tells us that it's paragraph 10. So a lot to take in there. As I say, it takes practice and probably requires you to frequently refer to the rules as you write until you get used to those rules. Make sure that you have a look at pages 39 to 66 of the AGLC because there are further rules to look at in relation to cases. Moving on to secondary sources, we are focusing on the sources that students most commonly use in their work, which are books and journal articles. There are other secondary sources like newspaper articles, web pages that you will need to look up as and when you use them, but we're just going to focus on the sources students most commonly use so that we're not overwhelming you with volumes of information. So let's start with books. The first thing that you need to do is present the author's full name followed by a comma. Now in some referencing systems you might only provide the surname or you might give the initial of the first name following the surname. But in the AGLC you must put the author's first name followed by their last name in that order. So first name first. And you should write the author's name as it appears on the source. So you can see the example there. On the source, the authors are Joel Butler and Terry Geiger. So that is how it is written. Sometimes writers only use their initials and don't provide their full first name. If that's the case, then you would just use the first initial followed by their surname. Now, if there are two authors, you write both names in full separated by and, as I've already mentioned. If there are three authors, write the full name of each author with and separating the last two authors' names. So for example, imagine that the book there is written by Joel Butler, Terry Geiger and John Jones. You would write it as follows. Joel Butler, comma, Terry Geiger and John Jones, comma. Now where there are more than three authors, we then move to using et al rather than uh, listing each author individually. So et al is used to symbolize that there are more than three authors. On the slide there's an example there. Laying Down the Law, which is a textbook, has five authors and you can see that when we have more than three authors what we do is we write the name of the author that is first listed on the book and then the phrase et al and a comma. Once you've got the authors sorted, you then need to provide the title of the book, which is italicized. So you can see the examples there, Austra Australasian Mooting Manual and Laying Down the Law are both italicized. Then you need to place the publishing details within round brackets. So you can see that we need to first provide the publisher, then the edition number, and then the year of publication, and they're separated by commas. So let's look at our example of uh, Joel Butler and Terry Geiger's book. You'll see that the publisher is LexisNexis Butterworths with a comma. It's the second edition with a comma and then the year of publication is 2012, all within the round brackets. Note that if there is no edition number then you would just take that aspect out and have the publisher and the year of publication. Now when you need to provide a pinpoint reference to a particular page within the book, we write the page number following the brackets. And there's an example there on the slide, you'll see that in relation to Joel Butler and Terry Geiger, we've got 8080 following the brackets. That tells the reader that that's page 80 within that book. Now make sure that you read pages 98 to 105, which cover the citation of books in detail. Looking at more secondary sources, this time journal articles, you can see that they look a little different to books, although there are also some similarities. Mm -hmm. The thing that appears first is the author's full name as it appears on the source. So with the first name and then the last name followed by a comma. And the rules about 
where there are more than three authors apply equally here to journal articles as they do to books. So where there's more than three authors, we would use et al after the first author's full name. So you can see there that the title of the journal article is placed into single quotation marks and there are no italics. Next follows the year of the journal article in brackets and again, similar to cases, Round brackets indicate that you locate the relevant paper by reference to the volume number, whereas square brackets indicate that it's the year that guides the location of the source. Then the volume number follows the year, so you can see on the example slide there that it's volume 42 of the UNSW Law Journal. Some journals have more than one issue per year. They might issue them quarterly, for example. So if that's the case, then note the issue number in brackets. So here you can see that when we're talking about Des Butler's article, it's issue three of volume 42. Then follows the journal name, and that is not abbreviated. It's written in full and it's written in italics. So note that we do not abbreviate journal names like we do law report series. Following the journal name, we then need the page at which the journal article starts. So you can see from the example that Des Butler's article can be found at page 1039 in issue 3 of volume 42 of the UNSW Law Journal. Now providing a pinpoint reference to a quote from the journal article or where the relevant work or idea can be located is the same for a journal article as it is for a book. So we place a comma at the end of the full citation details and provide the relevant page number. So if you look at the bottom of the slide there is an example of a pinpoint reference. We have page 1078 is the pinpoint reference within Des Butler's article. Our final slide looks at some basic general referencing rules. There are a large number of general rules at the beginning of the AGLC from pages 1 to 35 that you do need to look at. They can include things like how to refer to previously cited sources, how to indicate to a reader that you've added emphasis to a quote, etc. We're just going to look at a couple here to get you started. The first is that footnotes should always follow any punctuation. Usually, a footnote should appear at the end of the sentence after the full stop. However, if for clarity you need to place the footnote somewhere else within the sentence, then please do so. For example, if you had two quotes in the same sentence, you would need a footnote next to each quote so that the reader can understand which reference relates to which quote. Otherwise, it would get confusing having it all at the end of the sentence. Moving on to referring to previously cited sources, where the source is the same as that in the immediately preceding footnote, we use IBID. So let's say that you're just about to write the footnote reference for footnote 10. If footnote 10 is the same as footnote 9, which is the immediately preceding footnote, you would use IBID in footnote 10. Now, if the pinpoint reference is different, but it's still the same source, you can use IBID and then a space and then the new pinpoint reference. So here on the example, you can see IBID 39. That tells us that the source is identical to the one immediately above it, but the pinpoint reference is page 39 instead of whatever appears in the previous footnote. Where you have previously cited a source in your paper, but the reference is not the immediately preceding footnote, we cannot use IBID. So for example, if you're about to enter the referencing for footnote 10 and you're using the same source as that which appears in footnote 5, you can't use IBID because it is not the footnote immediately above. In this situation, you would use the format that's set out at the bottom of the slide there. So you would provide the author's last name, and then you would provide N and the footnote number in round brackets and then a pinpoint reference to the relevant page citation. So you can see here that that tells us that it's Butler's art article which is fully cited in note 5 and the page reference is 1072. 
So hopefully you can see how that works from the example there. Now there are lots of intricate rules like this so there's really no substitute for reading the AGLC and working through the examples it provides on each page. Note that the AGLC also has rules on citing international sources like treaties and foreign sources from domestic courts in other countries like the US Supreme Court and legislation from other nations. These are provided, these rules are provided at the back of the AGLC and uh, quite often are listed by country. While you are unlikely to need these in your first term at university, and I certainly don't want to overwhelm you with them right now, you may find that you start to look at other international materials in units later on. And you'll need to go back to the AGLC and follow the rules for those specific materials once you start to look at those sources. This brings us to the end of our whistle stop tour of the AGLC. There's really no substitute for reading it and constantly referring to it as you write your assignments. You will find, I promise, I know you don't believe it right now, but you will find that you will get quicker at referencing and need the guide less the more that you write and cite sources. And eventually you'll become a little bit of a, an expert at the AGLC. There are also some quick guides to using the AGLC provided in Moodle. Make sure you check those out and they all set out the information differently. So have a look at all of them and see which one is easiest for you to navigate and select the one that works best for you.